welcome, believe it or not, to the last moment of summer, almost fall, and we're pretty excited about that. I don't know how many of you have already gotten a taste of fall, but in Florida, where we're from, uh-uh. Hottest <laughs> it's ever been. It has to be. Yeah, so I, breaking. I love that we're doing that final taste of summer because I'm hoping that this is gonna kind of end it all. And That's all right. of a sudden, it's gonna be kind of drier and cooler and amazing. That's right, the weather's obviously just been waiting for us to finish yes, our summer classes. Exactly, without a doubt. <laughs> We're so happy you're joining us. This is Pam Smith, my favorite chef. Wow. We hope that she becomes yours, if not already. Um, she's also my mom, which makes these classes extra special for me. I'm Nicole. We, um, we are part of the PS Flavor Cooking Club. We started this as an opportunity to teach you um, some tips and tricks in the kitchen, how to flavor your food to get the most out of it, and really how to have delicious and nutritious meals, um, kind of stealth help. So, yeah. And to take the mystery out of yeah. it. Again, the things we're going to do today are, are really quick, easy go-tos that you can almost have in your back pocket. You'll discover very quickly that they are put together quite quickly, especially because a lot of it you can kind of get made up. We're going to be doing this amazing glaze that's going to go on top of the cod. Um, we're going to do this little pecan crumble. Both of those things I just keep in the refrigerator all the time because they're just perfect to be able to give you just what you need. That little crunch, that little sweetness, that little counterbalance that we're always looking for in dishes, and of course, don't forget the flavor. Absolutely. And if you are cooking with us and you haven't printed out your recipe yet or you don't have your booklet from your summer club kit, um, please take a moment to do that. Technology, usually our friend, but I think we all know that when technology is not your friend, you don't want to fight it. So if your internet goes down or our internet goes down, just keep going on. Use it as a time to catch up if yes. you're feeling a little behind. Pour a little, little glass of wine. <laughs> it's always a good thing. We're doing that. Yes. yes. And the main goal is a no-stress kitchen. So let's have a great time. We're going to cook. We're going to eat. Um, but one of our favorite things about this is that it's live. So if you have any questions right. that come up while you're cooking, or maybe you're just watching as a culinary demonstration. I think a lot of people do that. Yeah. Again, rather than what you know, our original thought is that everyone would cook with us, they'd get done, they'd post it, and a lot of you are doing just that, and we applaud you for that. But if you're tuning in maybe for the first time just to kind of get a sense of it, again, sit back, enjoy, learn. You can always go back and watch again. Absolutely. So after um, we finish this, we'll post it. You can go back, you can, you know, cook it again and again if yes. you want to follow. It's really bringing a recipe to life. So we hope that's what it is for you. But we have a lot to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I know we're going to get started. First things first, I think you wanted them to preheat their oven to 400. Is this that right? perfect time to get the oven turned on. We're going to do a fun thing. It's my favorite way to cook, really, almost any protein, <laughs> fish or chicken or pork tenderloin or steak, and that is we're going to start it on, on top of the stove, we're going to do a little pan sear, but then we're going to put it in the oven to roast it. So if it's not set at 400, this is the time to do this. All right, so, so what we haven't done is we need to do a cheers, right? Yes. Um, so to all of you, whether you're watching and sipping or those of you that are sweating a bit because you've been working really hard to get your prep together, those of you that are just saying, what, what, I'm supposed to print a recipe, <laughs> all fine to do. Cheers to you. Cheers to you. Another really awesome night. Yes, yes. So I'm going to go over, grab the camera, get some close-up as we go. Um, but before we do, I wanted to tell them about a knife that you're going to be using. Mm -hmm. So you are going to be using the Gourmet Prep Knife from Cutco, yes. which we've really been waiting for this night. We're so night. excited. I um, so we'll get to see Pam doing that, and then we have a giveaway for this knife with the PS Flavor logo on it. And um, we'll tell you more about that later, but just think, um, take a picture of your food and then post it afterwards. And that Whether it's tonight enjoy. or not, because yeah. we'll have a few weeks afterwards. Absolutely. That do the dish, post it, and then she always has this really fun way of doing a drawing. Yes, yeah, so yeah. that'll be, we'll see Pam using the gourmet prep knife. And, um, and you're gonna be using our Moroccan blend. And this yes. is our last night 
of the Moroccan blend in the classes, but that doesn't mean it's the last night of the Moroccan blend because if you guys are like me, it's become one of my new favorites. I absolutely love the Moroccan spice blend. There's just something so unique about the depth well, of it. It's a harissa. If you've heard of a harissa blend, generally harissas are a wet paste. Um, they're done with red bell peppers with lots of different spices. I've tried to take the essence of that, and I think we have, yeah. um, out. It's, it has some beautiful citrus notes, but then it's this amazing concoction of different kinds of spices, mm -hmm. kind of North, uh, North African, Moroccan, but it's just delicious in places you might expect it. Last month we did a lamb meatball that was amazing with orzo, we used it in that. But tonight, we're going to be using it in a cauliflower hominy mm -hmm. hash. So and you would think, but isn't that kind of southern? Well, it kind of can seem that way. You'll be amazed to see what it does for just lifting up the flavor. I love it. Well, I can't wait to taste it. We're going to be smelling it, of course, for the next mm -hmm. 45 minutes to an hour while we cook. Um, and we'll check back, but I'm going to go grab the camera. Great. So you already have, hopefully, your oven now turned on. Not a bad time to also get your fish out. Um, we're using cod tonight. That's what we called this recipe, but I hope you also picked up that if cod wasn't at its freshest best, you should go for whatever fish is. So that might be snapper or grouper or corvina or maybe you're lucky enough to have halibut. Anything that, again, is a kind of a white, somewhat firm fish. We're not looking for a flounder or something that's a little bit flaky, but no problem. If you did that, it's gonna work out fine. I, I wanna have a good base for the glaze and then this wonderful crumble that we're gonna put on top of it. Pull the fish out of the fridge because you wanna let it come up somewhat close to room temperature so that it's not such a shock when it hits the high heat of the skillet. Speaking of high heat, it's a good time to get started on our pecan crumble because that's what's going to ultimately go on. Um, I did this particular recipe because people love pecan chicken, they love pecan fish, but I was looking for a way to be able to do that um, really in a restaurant setting. I created this initially for a restaurant meal and they needed to be able to do it in a way that they could cook the fish on the flat top, your version of the oven, but be able to really have all that crunchy goodness. So what I did was I actually just started browning the crumble right on top of the stove. And that's what we're gonna be doing right now as we kind of get things started. Gonna get our um, pan hot. I use a cast iron skillet in this. We can um, figure out a way to get our oven turning on, which it's funny enough, not doing. It's you know, awesome. I've noticed that sometimes it doesn't do it when we have a few too, have many things, too many things. On and when top we're of making it. these meals, we yes. happen to uh, go big with things yes, on the stovetop. Yes, we tend to do that. So let's try that. Mm -hmm. Well, this could change the whole course of our class if we can't get that to happen. Wonder if that lightning that we just had might have had something fun to do. So. Wow, well, I am really excited about that. So I'm gonna take one more thing off. Yes, let's and see keep trying. And just continue to make the magic happen in really the best way possible. <laughs> so exciting. So have y'all had a good day? <laughs> <laughs> How has your day really happened? Now I'm taking everything yep, we'll off. We'll take it all off. That's what we need to do. Again, what, what does one do when they can't do what they want to do? Well, that is going to be the question of the day. I feel like we're watching a research study now, and what does Pam Smith do when it doesn't work? Pray. And it worked. <laughs> and it worked. Hooray. So I don't know that anything that just happened had anything to do with what just happened, but I'm really happy we've got some heat right now. As I mentioned before, I went into my little, wow, what's going on? Um, I am using a cast iron skillet, but any skillet can do. This is not going to go in the oven, so it doesn't necessarily have to be oven proof, but I'll say that almost all of my skillets are because of that technique I mentioned earlier. I start things on the stove and then I put them into the oven. So I like to do that. I'm gonna heat this up um, and then I'm gonna add just a little touch of olive oil to this. Again, basically, I'm gonna be browning my panko. Panko is a Japanese breadcrumb. Um, you may have bought Italian breadcrumbs through the years and have used them for doing a variety of things. Um, Japanese breadcrumbs kind of hit the States maybe, I don't know, 20 years or so ago. They're a drier, crisper kind of a breadcrumb, and so they 
really do beautifully with this. Um, again, what we're doing is just heating the oil and then quite simply just adding those dry breadcrumbs right to that olive oil and begin to just lightly brown them. I have the heat set on about a medium high and I'm gonna let those breadcrumbs just start to caramelize a bit. They'll start to brown, not so different than toasting bread in a toaster. And while they're browning, they're releasing, it's called the Maillard reaction, it's releasing a little bit of um, toastiness, just a little bit of sweetness to it. And again, this is something you don't really wanna rush, even though feeling like I've spent a little bit of time trying to get the stove working, the tendency is to wanna rush that through, but really can't do that because this is an essential part of it. Remember, I mentioned that this is something that you can make up in advance and have available. Um, again, doesn't need to be refrigerated. There's nothing in it that really requires that. It's just really a great thing to have. Sometimes I put some Parmesan cheese in it. It just gives a little more umami. With this one, we're gonna stick and make it pretty clear and simple. Just gonna be browning these and then we're going to be adding pecans and then a little bit of garlic and then in this particular one creole kitchen creole kitchen as you all know those of you that have cooked with me some of you for years at epcot food and wine festival um, i use creole kitchen almost like salt and pepper it has though something that salt and pepper doesn't have and that is much less sodium than salt um, it has a little different kind of pepper not just black pepper but also has some cayenne it has garlic, it has some onion, um, beautiful, beautiful blending, and its claim to fame is it has a little bit of smoked paprika in it. So you can see I'm lifting up the cast iron skillet now because it's browning and browning really nicely. And this is when I'm gonna add the chopped pecans. All that I've done with the pecans is very simply, either in a food processor or with this incredible knife that we have, I'm just going to stir those right in and let the heat of the skillet now start to cook those pecans a little bit as well. It does just a little bit of toasting action. This is a good time to turn the heat down and go ahead and add your garlic to this as well. The garlic um, actually starts to cook right in. It releases its aromas. Um, just about 30 seconds is all you need with that. And then also it's time to add that Creole kitchen that I spoke about. Really beautiful kind of a crumb topping that we'll be using then on top of the glaze that we're putting atop of the cot itself. And once done, just pull it away and it is done. All deliciousness. So Jenna is our Spice Girl and Jenna is the one that's responsible for taking some of your questions. So again, as they come to mind, just go ahead and ask them. Um, again, this is induction cooking, and what's amazing about it is that once you're done, it's done. It completely has no heat at all. All that it does is pick up um, the electromagnetic activity of what you're cooking with. So I can put a glass bowl right on top of it, although that might have thrown us off a little bit earlier. And I'm gonna go right into making our glaze. Um, the glaze is um, beautiful. It has some sweetness. I use a all fruit, like a Polliner um, jam. All fruit meaning it has no added sugar to it. Um, I use an apricot, a peach is fine to do too. We're wanting to use those because they have a really beautiful, neutral kind of taste. They're not adding so much of their own, just a really nice hint of some sweetness. To this, we're also gonna be adding mustard, some nice Dijon mustard, or if you're into Creole, Creole mustard is delicious in here, just like the Creole kitchen is. And no surprise, I'm also gonna add a little Creole kitchen to this as well. So now I'm doing kind of a layering of flavor. We're getting the Creole kitchen in the crumb topping, we're getting the Creole kitchen in this wonderful glaze and I'll be putting a little Creole kitchen on the cod as well right before it goes into the oven. Now and, I have a question. Yes. I've seen recipes before that call for a Creole mustard. Mm -hmm. If if I don't have that in my refrigerator but I just have mustard, could mm -hmm. I add Creole kitchen to it to make it a Creole mustard? Absolutely. The only thing that would be different, Creole mustard has a little 
um, larger grain. It's a it's a more of a whole grain mustard together with the Creole Kitchen. So again, if you have a, a large grain mustard, then add the Creole. It's almost exactly like a Creole mustard. Otherwise, just use a Dijon like we used here, which is a smooth mustard, but that Creole Kitchen gives it just that little extra punch Great. and deliciousness. So we're really all set to go with our cod. I'm not quite ready to do that cod yet though because it's gonna cook really, really quickly, but this is the cod. And again, even when you buy um, cod or any kind of fish, people are always asking, how do you assure that you're getting the freshest of fresh? And honestly, there's, there's three things that you employ. Um, one is sight, you see it, and it, it should have just a, kind of a, a nice, um, not overly shiny looking look. That means that some of the oils are starting to break out. You should touch it and it should, again, almost um, spring back to touch. Um, if you push down on it, it should spring right back. And you would say, but Pam, I, I can't ask the fish person behind the counter to let me touch the fish. Well, interestingly enough, they have gloves on. You, they may not want you to touch it, but you can ask them to touch it and see if it does the same thing. But the most important aspect is, is using your nose. The nose knows. When it comes to fish, again, just getting that, that breathe in of the fish, it should smell of the sea, but it shouldn't smell fishy. If it smells fishy, something is indeed fishy. Fresh fish is not always fresh fish, it's not always fresh fish. Get to know your fishmonger, as they're called, that person behind the counter at your grocery store. They know what's come in. Look at them deep in the eyes and get to know them and know them well. Um, when we get ready to cook that, what we'll be doing is, as I said, putting just that little bit of Creole seasoning on, we'll sear it, and then we'll top it with the beautiful toppings that we just made. Looks amazing. Well, I think it will be, now that I have um, everything hidden. <laughs> A little bit of a question right there of what we're doing. I think what we'll move right into doing now is into making our um, hash, which is the cauliflower hominy hash. And it's really, um, I don't know, a go-to for me. Um, again, a number of years ago as people were beginning to look at some alternatives to some of the starches that they might traditionally have. A lot of people that were trying to avoid grains, a lot of people that were trying to move away from classic potatoes, you know, cauliflower kind of became the golden child in lots and lots of ways. And it's because you can use cauliflower for so much. You can mash it, um, you can roast it. In this case, we're ricing it, which I know a few of you have done before. Ricing it meaning that we're literally putting it into almost a rice form by getting it into the food processor. Um, so on your grocery list, we talked about getting a head of cauliflower and just breaking it into its florets. You don't need to do much of a chop, although you certainly can do a little bit of a rough chop with it. You're gonna let the food processor do its work. And that's what we're gonna do right now is literally get it in play. Now, while you do that, I had someone ask me where they can get the um, Creole seasoning, the Creole kitchen and the Moroccan spice. And we'll also be using Smoky Southern later. Mm -hmm. And all of those are available um, at psflavorclub.com mm -hmm. and Moroccan only until the end of the month. Yes. So we will then move on to our fall, which we can't wait to tell everybody about. Should we go ahead and just break into it? I don't think so. I okay, think we have to hold, hold them back. in suspense. It's difficult because we're so excited about it. But again, I would say don't lament. We're pretty sure that we'll end up seeing a rock and come back at another time because it's just too good. I know I'm gonna keep making it for sure. Um, so again, we're getting our cauliflower in place. We're gonna try to get our trusty food processor working for us the right way. All right, while you do that, I'm gonna show what the, um, the panko is looking like. Because it's nice and loud. Part to move away just as I was starting to do that. 
I did. I felt like it was important for all that are watching. <laughs> yes. So you see what's happened is it started to rise towards the bottom. There's still just a little bit towards the top. It needs just a little bit more of a breakdown. Um, again, depending on how much you're making. That'll probably work just fine for us right now. We're gonna add that. Um, actually, I'm just gonna put it right on top of this dish. And then we're gonna use the same food processor to do the hominy. Now, if you've not ever looked at hominy, didn't even know such a thing as hominy existed, your world is getting ready to be changed. I'm absolutely in love with it. Um, Hominy is an ingredient in, of, in pozole, which is a beautiful Mexican soup. Um, it's made from corn. It's just the corn kernel that um, has been bathed and breaks apart and swells up. And it's this beautiful taste. If you love the taste of tortillas or masa, the, the flour that makes tortillas, you will love, love, love hominy because it has all of that wonderful toastiness. Again, for people that are looking for gluten-free kinds of alternatives, it is, um, but it's so much more. It just gives this incredible pop of flavor. Again, you buy it um, just in the canned section of the store, and all that you're looking to do is just drain it because what we're going to do is now add it to the food processor and put it to about the same size as the cauliflower that we just did. again end up getting into the cauliflower it really looks the same if you see it it has that beautiful white color although i will tell you i've also done the same dish using golden cauliflower and purple cauliflower and sometimes even a medley or romesco if you've ever seen that it's a um, type of cauliflower that looks like um, i don't know the dinosaurs ate it potentially so again we have that all ready to go and all we're going to do is just do a really quick kind of a hash. Now, it's not really a hash in the classic sense. You tend to think of potatoes in a hash, but I'm going to do a stir fry with it. Um, just get it nice and browned and toasty, and then we're going to be adding, um, and again, this is where the Moroccan's going in. Then we're going to add some feta, some herbs. Absolutely fantastic. But in the short term, it's now time to get working on the fish because we are ready. While you uh, get that started, Andrew Matthews, who cooks with us, mm -hmm. um, just put this idea out there that pozole might be a great fall recipe, um, in which I know that you love that idea. We've already got our fall recipes in the works. So Andrew, I'm going to put the challenge back at you that we want to see what you can do with some pozole and PS flavor. Ah, and if anyone can do it, Andrew, Andrew can definitely Andrew do it. Can. I, Andrew, while we're talking, I loved your post about the octopus demo last year. It was quite funny and quite funny to even see the picture. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to let that start to heat before I add the olive oil to it. And then I'm going to use that little bit of Creole seasoning to season um, the cod or the, flat, the um, grouper or the snapper, whichever fish you might have done. Now, I think it's really important to note that when you're using Creole, you're not looking to use it as a rub. No. Unless you're wanting a really full heat dish, um, it's really using it as your salt and pepper. It so is. in the same way that you wouldn't probably rub your fish with salt and pepper, think of it that way on how much Creole you want right. to use. Yeah, you're doing literally a sprinkling of it the way you would sprinkle um, the fish or whatever you might have with salt and pepper. I heat the pan first and then I add the olive oil to it. I'm not heating the olive oil. I'm wanting to just get it in right before I add the fish. 
then I'm putting it um, the, the lovely side down, which is the side that I'm gonna be serving um, face up, and I'm also the side that I put the Creole on. Okay, so you're only putting the Creole on one side of the fish. No, I'm not. Oh, now that she I've got tricked me. In, then I'm gonna sprinkle it on this side too. Why, you might ask? Why? <laughs> because you want both sides of the fish to taste good, Ah, uh, right? yes. Not just one, although the other side is gonna be quite magical because it's going to have this wonderful glaze and the wonderful um, humble with it as well. We're gonna let that cook for just about two minutes or so. Time to get just a little sip of wine. That was a cue for you to do the same thing. And I think we started to say what we were drinking, but I always give Pam's pairings with each of our recipes. And this particular recipe just seems so perfect to have with bubbles. I'm starting to notice I'm wanting to have every dish with bubbles. It seems to be a perfect pairing, but also beautiful with a Pinot Gris. And I specifically called out in Oregon, um, kind of Northwest, um, Pinot Gris. Um, again, we know that the Northwest is beautiful for Pinot Noir. It's also beautiful for Pinot Gris, which is the American um, varietal of what you would know as Pinot Grigio, but it just has such a beautiful, almost creamy kind of texture to it. Um, some really beautiful, bright fruit. We're not wanting to struggle too much with this. We're wanting just to see if it's ready to turn over. Bandaging. Oh, beautiful. Again, if you have to scrape it, that's one of your signs that more than likely it wasn't too ready to have the turn just happen. <laughs> Once it does, though. I have a feeling you're not the only one doing a few coughs. I know when we, <laughs> when we cook primarily with Creole Kitchen, um, it does clear you out, clear your sinuses out. It's a beautiful thing. So and now you're putting your... Um, this is the beautiful glaze that we did with the apricot jam, the Dijon mustard, and the Creole seasoning. And you see, I'm putting this on while I'm letting the other side just begin to brown just a bit. Literally just spreading it right on top because it's gonna be the delicious blue that is going to then allow the pecan crumble to be able to stay in place. Oh, look at that. So why you wanna have the crumble all set and ready to go is for just this magic moment. And you can see, I'm gonna have some extra pecan crumble left. Just put it in an airtight container and you can use it, again, on chicken, on pork chops. It's um, really, really just a beautiful little topping. And, and a surprising one, I love to put it on top of salads. Oh. Um, just a little sprinkle on top of a salad kind of gives you the flavor of a crouton, but with that little nuttiness that goes with the pecans. And I'm surprised no one has asked this question yet. And the question is, can you use other nuts besides pecans? And the answer to that is, oh, yes, you can. So you see, I'm going to put this right now into the oven, already preheated at the 400, and it's going to cook really quickly. So. We're only gonna to need to have that in the oven probably another five to six minutes tops, which we're gonna to have to be somewhat aware of. And it'll be perfect timing to then proceed and go ahead and get um, the cauliflower hash cooking for us. All good? All great. If anyone has any questions, feel free to pause and ask. I have a feeling I'm, I'm seeing the people that are cooking with us. I have a feeling that they are trying to uh, catch up and keep up. Well, I'm hoping that while we were working on our stovetop, uh, lots of people caught right up. That's right. That was just a ploy, it wasn't really it? Was. We were it just giving, giving time. It was a love gift. All right. So what are we making now? So this is going to be the cauliflower hash. So we're putting just a little bit of that right into the pan. Um, and we're going to let, again, the pan heat. We're adding that little touch of olive oil. And then we're going to be using... Um, the cauliflower that we already riced together with the hominy that we riced to do a really beautiful stir fry. And that is just about ready to go. Great. We'll see the olive oil start to dance a bit. Now, if you don't have induction and you just put your saute pan on, 
um, give it a few minutes. Yes. Let it get let it get hot before you before you put this in because you really want it to sizzle once you do. Mm -hmm. If you remember, because we were now cinched for a little space, I put that riced cauliflower right on top of the other. So I want to make sure that I'm getting all the right sizes in play, and also going to add that beautiful hominy right into it. If again, this is your first time having hominy. I will tell you it's become my go-to, one of my favorite um, things to do for breakfast. I'll do hominy with some black beans and some of our Creole kitchen and oh my my, absolutely delicious. And this, however, is not going to be using Creole kitchen. This is what's using our wonderful Moroccan. Yes, so sir. Let that get going a little bit first. Literally just doing a nice little browning of it. Awesome. So we're browning before we put in the seasoning. Mm -hmm. Is that typically what you try to do is season last with things that you're cooking like this? Or how do we know? Well, that's a really great question because, you know, the rules can change just a little bit because this is going to take a little while to saute, um, but I'm still going to have it in the oven. I'm using the seasoning almost the way I would use garlic. I would add it towards the end and have it sauteing for about... 30 seconds or so. Um, it's also the same time I'm going to then look to be adding my feta so it can just start to melt a little bit along with it. Oh my gosh. I know, um, I love we're, that we're spice. Be making this. So you see, that's exactly what I'm now doing. Okay, so this is the Moroccan mm -hmm. spice. Oh, that looks great. Nicole would like to tell you the story that I made this once, not because we were planning to cook it for this particular class, but because um, I just thought, oh, well, let's try Moroccan on this. It'll be delicious, because we usually would use Creole Kitchen. Um, we used the Moroccan, and this night was born right there. It was. Right there. That, that very night when you made it, we decided this had to be one of the cooking club classes. So again, just doing a nice little saute for just about 30 seconds or so with that. And then I'm going to add um, the feta cheese and a little bit of herb. Okay. And this is just feta cheese crumbles, uh -huh. right? Exactly. Okay. And just a little touch of any herb. This is flat leaf parsley, but you could also use basil. I've used a little bit of mint with it. Um, any of those can do. And you're just chopping it and putting mm -hmm. it in? Exactly. Okay. And, and we're done. Wow. It's one of the quickest things you can do, especially there's some tricks of the trade. Let's hear them. You can actually buy the cauliflower already riced. We didn't do that. We went ahead and did the food processor. Um, Trader Joe's sells it in a really, really big bag. Publix has it. If you live in the South, Whole Foods has it. Um, you can also buy it frozen. Costco has really, really big bags of it. And, um, in a, and that works out really beautifully too. If you were to use it frozen in this dish, um, what you'd want to do is put it in first and um, straight from the back. Don't thaw it, don't cook it, don't do anything. Put it straight in, let that first thaw, and then start to saute it. And when it really does begin to take on a little bit of color, that's when you would end up adding um, the hominy and the remaining things. What remains to be done with this is a taste. Ah, uh, is everybody at home wondering, is Pam gonna think it's the best she's ever made? Oh, it is pretty darn good. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Gonna add just a little more touch of Moroccan. Again, that's always to taste. And then we're gonna let it just kind of rest and be happy. Now, when you're letting it rest, are you putting it on low or turned it off. just turned it off? Yeah, so turned heat it off. off. Heat off. Okay, great. So let's go over and check on our fish. Great, it's been six minutes. I had my exactly. eye on the clock. For that, you can get a little sense of what it's done by, again, the little touch test. It doesn't just work when you are um, trying to see if it's fresh, but it also works if you're trying to see if it's done. Um, again, Fish will cook very, very quickly, especially when it's this kind of um, lighter fish. And we're wanting to get it up to coming out of the oven around 140-ish. 
and then it'll have some carryover cooking. Um, the thinner pieces will cook a lot quicker. So I've got one of these that's measuring right around 150. I've got another one that's measuring 160. So we probably should have checked it in about four minutes. Again, similarly, I'm just gonna let that sit and be happy. Um, it has almost some spy, um, some sauce that's cooked in with having the beautiful um, glaze that was on it with a little pecan crusting. So we're gonna let that just rest a bit. And while we do that, we're gonna move on and do the broccolini. All right. Now, broccolini is something that um, it took us a few stores to find. And so those making it at home may be making and this dish with asparagus or green beans. And you seem to think that that was a better alternative than broccoli, is that right? Well, only because broccoli is so delicious, but broccoli doesn't cook as well when you're doing a quick saute like we were doing, whereas the asparagus works really, really nicely and easily. Great. So if you are if you are making with broccolini um, mm -hmm. and you want to take a pause and, and raise your hand on the, the <laughs> chat, you can let us know that you did find broccolini. We found it at um, Fresh Market. We did. So we did. Not, not too far. It wasn't at our normal local grocery store, but Fresh Market was but great. But the normal local grocery store has it. It's just that they didn't have it on this Wednesday. Ah. Not a concern. Okay, now you have already blanched the broccolini, is that correct? I did, um, but I did a blanching with a difference. The classic blanching and almost all of my recipes that are gonna go ahead and stir fry a green vegetable, I blanch it first. I dip it in boiling water um, just for a minute or so, just enough to kind of seal in the green. But a little shortcut that you can also do is you can just pop it in your microwave. That's asparagus, that's green beans, that's broccolini. Again, that steaming action of the microwave. I put just a little bit of water in the bottom. If it's asparagus, I don't sit it up like this. This was just too cute not to do. Um, instead, I just lay it out on a platter with just a little bit of water at the bottom that does its own kind of steaming. Just about two to three minutes with this amount is all that you need to do. Um, by the way, if you're not sure what broccolini is, it's a, it's a kind of a cross between asparagus and broccoli. So again, you've got the longer kinds of, of stems which make it just absolutely perfect and beautiful for being able to do this very quick kind of saute. And that's just what we're gonna do. Just get them right into the pan. So all you have at this pan. point is olive oil and broccolini. That's it. Nothing and a hot pan. And a very hot pan. I'm literally wanting to um, almost sear it just a little bit the way I would sear meat or any other thing. And you see, because it did have that little bit of blanching action, it's keeping that vivid green as compared to immediately hitting the pan and starting to turn kind of an unappetizing olive color. Um, it takes a little bit of time. Um, to be able to do, again, the blanching, not only a sealing and the color, it's also starting to soften the broccolini. So again, in this case, I would just let it just do its thing. I've got the, the heat on kind of a medium high heat and occasionally just get in there and kind of move it around. Um, you can also roast it. Um, and that's a beautiful way to do broccolini or asparagus. Um, we do almost the same thing toss it with just a little bit of olive oil, and in this case, the seasoning, we're using a smoky southern seasoning, um, toss it with that and then get it into a hot pan, one that you've heated in the oven. Those of you that have been cooking with us for months know that that's one of the things that I just am unwavering with. If you're gonna roast vegetables, the best way to get the best of flavor is to heat your pan in the very hot oven, toss your vegetables with that little bit of olive oil and seasoning, and then add it um, right to that hot pan. You hear the same kind of sizzle that you heard with this. You heard the same kind of sizzle when I put the cod into the cast iron pan, and works beautifully. So again, we're letting that happen. While we're letting that happen, I wanna talk a little bit about the Smoky Southern because it's one of our favorites. Um, I was working with a restaurant 
um, company that um, really um, is all about celebrating Southern and Southern cuisine. But as you know, Southern cuisine oftentimes has a lot of bacon fat, a lot of, of ham uh, hock in it. So I was looking for a way to get that same smokiness and I did that by using smoked paprika. Smoked paprika with a little bit of lemon, um, again, onion and, and garlic. It just has such a great flavor and it's beautiful to do. You notice this recipe is called smoky broccolini because it really does bring out just so much of those beautiful smoked flavors. Um, we want to check and see um, the tenderness factor of this because you're not wanting it to be mushy, but you're also not wanting it to be raw. Um, you do want to have that crisp, tender kind of action going on. Once you get it to a place that you're kind of ready to go, that's when you add the smoky southern. You're not wanting to, back to that same question, oh my gosh, the aromas of that hitting mm -hmm. the pan are really unbelievable as I start to cough again. <laughs> yes, I do. You know, until you taught me how to blanch, especially in the microwave because I love a kitchen hack. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know how to keep that bright green. Mm -hmm. And now the blanching has made it so beautiful, especially when we go to plate. Because right. I think a lot of times we're so, you know, tell us what you're doing. Okay, before I do this. Um, so what's going to add just a little bit of added um, pop of flavor. I already have a little bit of lemon in the Smoky Southern, but I also want to add just a little bit of lemon zest. And again, those of you that are club members have this really fancy microplane. If you don't have a microplane, heartily recommend it because it's just one of those kitchen tools that are, is just phenomenal. You see I'm just gliding it right on just the skin of the lemon itself, packing it in. It gives that ability to just give this incredible pop of flavor. Then with my incredible knife, I'm cutting the lemon in half. I've already microwaved the lemon. Many of you know that that's another one of my tips. Microwave the lemon for about 30 seconds. It's just enough to pop open those wonderful cells of the lemon and allows you to get much more moisture released into it. Okay, so you're using a whole lemon mm -hmm. that you have put in the microwave to get more juice and then cut in half. Exactly. Great. And now we add it right on top of it. It starts to make this wonderful, again, pop of citrus flavor. That smoky southern is almost charred into the broccolini. And we are ready to go. Happy? Very happy. Okay. So I think we should go ahead and think about plating, unless there's some questions in tow. And with plating this, you're really looking to just let it be, and that is let it be simple. Because this is really just, in some ways, delicious, simple food. This is the kind of meal you want to be serving your family. It's the kind of meal you want to be serving friends. But it's the kind of meal that can come together, again, relatively quickly, which is amazing. At least we feel that. Um, and then this is pretty much my classic plating. I put a little mound of the hash, um, the cauliflower and hominy hash. And then I'm gonna take one of our beautiful pieces of cod and try to gently lift it up without breaking it and place it right on top of that beautiful little mound. Mm -hmm. And then take the broccolini that is beautifully cooking. You see how it's got that nice kind of charring, but as you say, Nicole, it's kept that beautiful green color. And then we want to add, if you would like, um, just a few little tomatoes um, to give it just a little bit of color to this dish. Um, you could squeeze a little bit of lemon on the tomatoes too. Top it with just a little more of your smoky southern, or in this case, why not? How about topping it with a little bit of the Moroccan? Because we can. And then I might also think about just slicing another lemon. Um, because I already have lemon juice, you always want to garnish with something that 
you are using in the dish. And since I have used the lemon already in the broccolini, um, just a couple of rounds of that lemon can sometimes be all you need to just make a little added magic happening. Yeah, one of the things that I think we noticed when we were um, developing this dish for the class is the cauliflower hominy hash and the cod, despite mm -hmm. the fact that their flavors are very different, mm -hmm. their colors are very mm -hmm. similar. And so I love what you're doing to bring out those pops of color around the hash and the cod. Then I put just a little touch of a flat leaf parsley that I've saved and here we go. Wow. It's looking pretty fine, right? Absolutely, it looks delicious. If anybody has any questions, now is a great time. And I think I am going to show our amazing chef and then I'm gonna grab my wine and yes, join you. Do. Everyone always wants to know afterwards, well, who's eating the other cod? What are you all doing with that? Well, as soon as we finish our time, we always have a little toast to you all and a little toast to what an incredible night we've had. And then we eat. Yes. It's what we're all supposed to do, right? It is. I can't yeah. wait to eat it. Um, I wanted to just take a minute, because we have a minute, mm -hmm. and talk about what's to come. Yes. Before, uh, that, before that, we say that goodbye. We, that we teased them with about. The, I know, we did. We really loved them in suspense. It. Yes. Um, <laughs> so we've been working and talking and thinking, what do we do for the fall? Mm -hmm. How do we make it extra special? You know, we started the cooking club in January. So we've really made it through these months, made some incredible meals, but we wanted to finish this year off strong with a really awesome fall. But we thought, what do we do to bring the flavor of fall? And you want to tell them? Well, what do you think about when you think of fall? Well, if, if you even live in the United States, you know that Starbucks starts really kind of mid-August teasing us with the fact that pumpkin pie spice, pumpkin pie spice lattes are coming to a Starbucks near you. We've started to think of pumpkin pie spice, even though pumpkin pie spice doesn't have pumpkin in it. Mm -hmm. We've started to think of that as almost being the heralding that fall is here, that fall is coming. Yes. So we, Do you all feel, do you get tired of pumpkin spice because uh, I know a few of the Spice Girls that work with us, they, they love it, but they, they kind of make fun of it. Yes. So we decided to uh, take it up a notch. To take it up a really big notch. And so we now say, move over pumpkin pie spice. There's a new spice in town, and that is chai. If you're familiar with chai at all, it has some of the same kinds of ingredients of pumpkin pie spice. It has cinnamon and ginger and nutmeg, but what takes it up is a little lacing with cloves and cardamom. Absolutely amazing because we're all about 